any carbon material between two electrodes, you put a high voltage and a high current through it, it breaks every bond in the system. And then it reconstructs as graphene, the thermodynamically most stable form of carbon. Heteroatoms like silicon, aluminum, they all sublime out because this heats to 3100 Kelvin. That's about 2800 degrees centigrade in about 100 milliseconds. $30 in electricity per ton of material. No water, no solvents, self-purifying. The ability to make graphene is orders of magnitude less cost than traditional methods. And so every other company is, is, is having a rough time. I guess you could, you could short these other companies if you want to, because uh, they're gonna have a rough time. We've taken a bunch of different technologies out of our lab that the students have done and, and uh, brought them into companies. Uh, so it, here's a list of the companies that we've started over the past eight years. It's about 1.5 billion in uh, valuation. Uh, Dots makes graphene quantum dots. It's a public company now. It's used for, for uh, um, anti-counterfeiting where we will use specific fluorescent tags and they'll go into high-end women's purses and shoes and uh, uh, so you can you can mark them and authenticate them because they leave Milan uh, en route to say the Galleria in Houston and Neiman Marcus and somewhere along the way the package was opened and Vietnamese material has been put in that is very hard to tell apart from the real material so this has has uh, certain fluorescent codes and then there's a light that puts on it that confirms its authenticity. It's also being uh, uh, looked at for being put in marijuana uh, because in many of these shops in the states that legalize it, uh, the, the, uh, what's being sold in the shops is not government marijuana. And so you can put this in the, in the uh, soil, just add it in water in the soil that gets taken up in the plants, it goes in their leaves and then you get a fluorescent tag in the leaves when you, when you shine a light on it. It tells you it's being used in frac water and it's just carbon, so it just burns away. Uh, Weebit, it's a silicon oxide uh, computer memory. Uh, that company is public. It has gone up since summer of 2020. As of this morning, it has gone up 35X, 35X. So that's, that's pretty good since 2020. And, uh, um, so that, that's doing quite well. I, I think it just hit a, a billion dollars of investment right now. Um, and then they're about to come out with it, launch their memory chip uh, right about now. Um, uh, Zeta Energy, that's uh, here in town, that have us about uh, 25 employees it's making batteries. And uh, it's, a, it's a lithium, lithium, uh, lithium anode and a sulfur carbon cathode. And so uh, uh, the first generation battery will be at least 1.5x what any lithium ion battery can do. And uh, I know they're targeting probably the drone market is probably the first market, but, but I, I don't, I'm, I'm not an officer or director in any of these companies. So whatever I say, is just, just uh, what I've heard on the street. Uh, neural cords is graphene nanoribbons for spinal cord repair. Xeriant is for pancreatic cancer treatment. It's in phase two clinical trials. Uh, that's, that's something we've developed with folks at MD Anderson. And uh, we were actually developing uh, something to protect humans from a radiation blast if there's a plume of radiation coming over a major city. And, and uh, none of that ever happened in the United States, but uh, pancreatic cancer is, is, is something. And uh, so that, that's, that's that company and it's doing quite well. It's the only two that are public are number one and number two. Uh, Geronox is for Down syndrome, traumatic brain injury, stroke, and dementia. That's a project that we, we started it with uh, uh, Baylor College of Medicine, and now it's now that, that professor's moved to Texas A&M Medical School here in Houston. And so that's with Tom Kent is, is overseeing that. Rust Patrol, uh, that you can go to the internet and look up Rust Patrol. That's something that I actually developed with my own hands. Uh, uh, I, about, about 15 years ago, I went in the lab maybe 10 years ago and spent spent about a year developing a, a corrosion inhibitor and it turned out it worked and rice gave me the ip and i sold the company twice because it i uh, got about half the money and then it came back to me because they didn't complete the payments and i sold it again and and uh so that, that's a, a, a rust inhibitor roswell me is a molecular electronics company 
And uh, I think they're like in their Series C raise. They probably raised uh, 75 to 85 million, something like that at this point. Um, Nano robotics, I will talk about that today. That's for molecular machines and medicine. Uh, and then Forbon uh, Wuxi is uh, laser induced graphene. Uh, to date, we've only licensed the use in air filters. Uh, uh, H2 Blue is a company where we're taking waste plastic, a problem, and using it to trap carbon dioxide, another problem. So we're using one, one problem to address another. Universal matter <clears throat> is flash graphene, so I'll talk about that uh, and other 2D materials. And this is the fastest growing company I've ever been a part of. Universal matter is just soaring. And Dewey Luong, who's in the back, is the one who discovered this process. Most of everything you will see, I didn't discover. So what's interesting about this field is that is that people say, how'd you discover that? I say, oh, I didn't do it. My, my student really discovered this. And then they give me more credit because I think I'm really, I'm really magnanimous for giving my students credit. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, but these are the folks who've done it. And then, and then flash, flash heating for rare earth elements, uh, flash reading for, uh, heating for urban mining. And uh, Mark, who's here, uh, no, not that one, that one, sorry about that. Mark is here, is helping me to launch uh, uh, these, these new companies as well as H2 Blue. He's, he's come alongside to help us, so we'll talk about that. We discovered a number of years ago, we had made nano cars, little vehicles that could drive. Uh, they were single molecule cars. You could park 50,000 of them across the diameter of human hair. Then we took the motors, which are called Faringa motors, and we associated them with cell surfaces, and they could drill through cell surfaces and kill the cell. And so, so uh, um, you shine a light on them and they'll kill that cell. They'll drill through, poke holes in it, and the cell dies. So we're using this to kill super bacteria. Super bacteria is slated to kill 10 million people a year by the year 2050. So I tell students when you're about my age, COVID will look like a walk in the park because we can't deal with bacteria anymore. We, they're just resistant to everything that we throw at them. And uh, there's been no new uh, 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 antibacterial agents, new classes of them in the last 40 years. And you say, well, why not? Well, because there's no money in it in that uh, these, these, these bugs evolve so quickly, you don't accrue your money back by the time uh, 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 the, their, their efficacy is still lasting. What we do is we have a mechanical action now which drills into them and kills them. They can't build a resistance to this. It's like trying to build a resistance to a scalpel. It's not going to happen. Um, we also shown that it can kill uh, uh, fungi. Fungi are multicellular organisms already killing 1.6 million people per year because fungi, uh, we just lose control of them. This kills fungi very quickly. And we're also addressing cancer and killing cancer with these. Uh, so here's some data. It's, it, this is not hard to understand. Let me just show you this. Here, at, what you see at the top here is how well, how well these drugs can kill, uh, can kill these bacteria. These are the known drugs, all the lines at the top are the known drugs, and they are totally ineffective. Ours are killing, this is a logarithmic scale. This is five logs down. So within, within uh, a couple of hours, it kills everything. So we, have, we can kill any of these, these uh, super bacteria. These are super bacteria. These are bacteria that don't respond anymore to antibiotics. And this just kills them within minutes, yes. Is it easy to explain how they drill down mechanically, or is that complex? Uh, it's not complex for, for me. <laughs> so what happens is, is you have a double bond in there, and when you shine a light on it, it moves orthogonal. That can go down either way. And, and, uh, uh, but because there's a neighboring stereogenic center, these two ways are different, and energy keeps going over the lower energy side, so it spins unidirectionally and drills a hole. Uh, we, we've shown, for example, this is E. coli. This is E. coli that's not been treated. This is E. coli that's been treated. You can see it's just all clocked. It has all these holes drilled right into it. So it kills E. coli. Uh, we've developed a whole new type of, of molecular machine that's like a jackhammer. So rather than spinning, it, it's, it's a jackhammer. And it, the spinning on the nanomachines is, is about uh, 3 megahertz. So it's 3 million rotations per second. These nanomachines are, are picoseconds, so it, it's, it's a trillion vibrations per second. So we're, we're six orders of magnitude faster now. These are super killers, amazing killers. And uh, 
So this is, this is what happens to a tumor on a, on a mouse. It just keeps growing. When you treat with these nanomachines, it's just gone. 50% of the mice, the first experiment we did on mice, 50% of the mice, even seven months after, the tumors have not come back. Very, very unusual. Almost always you stop treatment and after a month, the tumors start growing back. That's why people euthanize quite early before this happens. We just let the, the, the mice just live and live. And so, so they, 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 they go on. This is in this company, Nano Robotics. It's, it's uh, still raising and still going on. And uh, um, there's, there's work. Uh, some of my students are at MD Anderson doing some of the work on cancer. And we're doing all the work on, on the super bacteria as well and fungi. Uh, so the take-home message is there's different ways to treat ailments. One is surgery, another is radiation, which generates reactive oxygen species. Another is chemotherapy, immunotherapy, generic, genetic therapy. But now there's a mechanical effect. This is mechanical effects at the nanometer scale. It is a new modality of treatment, something that has never been shown before. It's a new modality to treat and to kill cells. Another project is we've developed a system and a, a student in my group developed a method. You can take any laser that's found in any machine shop. These laser cutters, laser scribers, there's probably some in this building. There's probably 10 of them on the Rice campus. You take that laser, you hit it on any carbon material. Here it's polyimide and it converts the surface of the material to graphene. Graphene is this new space age material that's stronger than anything at the two dimensional scale. It does not drop graphene on the surface. It converts the surface to graphene. We discovered this in 2013. This is on polyimide. This is on a coconut made into a supercapacitor. This is on wood, a cardboard box. This is on paper. This is on, on, uh, on a piece of bread. Any carbon material. You're sitting on carbon. The vast majority of what you see around you is carbon. We're made out of carbon. It converts it into graphene. And so, so uh, this is the number of papers. So we discovered this in 2013. Last year, there were over 500 papers published using laser-induced graphene. This is being used in so many applications. We've got about five patents filed on this. The first patent has already been approved in multiple nations, including China. Uh, uh, the second patent, several nations have already uh, approved it. And uh, uh, the number of citations, 18,000 citations last year. Of, of, of this work. So it is growing tremendously, the use of laser-induced graphene. And uh, 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 the first product on the market is called a viral wall. It's made in, in, in uh, Shenzhen, China, and uh, um, it's, it's selling, it's hard to even keep up with sales. What it, it looks sort of like a speaker. It's drawing in air from both sides. There's a fan in there drawing in air. So when people sit on opposite sides from each other, it's drawing in the air. It kills 99.9% .9 of the SARS-CoV-2 virus on each pass. It's going through a porous filter of laser-induced graphene. We give occasional voltage pulse, and it just destroys the virus. And fresh air blows out, out the top of it. So it's like a virtual shield of graphene between the two sides of the discussion. These, this is moving into also trapping bacteria. That's, in fact, what we had developed it for in 2019, not knowing that in 2020 it would be like the year of the virus. Uh, uh, but it, it work, works very well for bacteria. It's going to be going into, uh, the next product is going to be going into pig farms. Swine flu kills over, they have to kill over a million pigs in China every year because of the swine flu going between different stalls. And so they'll put these in, in, in each of the stalls there. It'll go into hospitals. It'll go into air handling systems. So, so that's, that's the first application area. But there are many applications for water purification, for electronics. We've made 5G antenna out of these. You can draw any pattern on a surface. So that's in the company. Uh, 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 it's in a company now, Forbond, but there's, there's new companies that can launch from that. We have another company called H2 Blue, which, which Mark Lay is helping us uh, uh, to, to bring forward. Uh, we take waste plastic. We convert it into a material that absorbs carbon dioxide. And the way this is done, and, and actually this, this is work by, by, uh, uh, by Paul in the back there, it absorbs carbon dioxide at about 75 degrees, still absorbs uh, about 16 or 17% by weight carbon dioxide. So it's coming out of a flue gas. We don't have to cool the flue gas. So this coming out of 75 degrees, it'll absorb the CO2. This is how much CO2 it absorbs in a 10% CO2 stream, which is the amount of CO2 you have coming out of a flue gas. It's about 10% CO2, about 80% uh, nitrogen, and the rest water and a little bit of oxygen. And 
we release it by heating it up to 110. So there's a 35 degree delta window between capture and release. Right now, what is used is aqueous amine towers, which are corrosive, and, and you're picking up at near room temperature and you have to heat up to 140 degrees to blow this off. So your delta of your temperature swing is much higher. Uh, hopefully we can have a demonstration, a, a planning, a pilot demonstration by Q3 of this year with the Houston-based oil service company uh, using this, this, uh, this material. So this is from the company H2 Blue. Uh, this is the flash dual heating system. Uh, this was built by, by Dewey Luong. And so the idea is that you put any carbon material so that other material that I showed you that laser reduces you, it's drawing patterns on a surface. This is taking in bulk by the ton. You take material, any carbon material, between two electrodes, you put a high voltage and a high current through it. It breaks every bond in the system. And then it reconstructs as graphene, the thermodynamically most stable form of carbon. Heteroatoms like silicon, aluminum, they all sublime out because this heats to 3,100 Kelvin. That's about 2,800 degrees centigrade in about 100 milliseconds. Actually, it heats to that temperature in 10 milliseconds. We run it for about 100 milliseconds. And this is the device that Dewey actually built during the COVID shutdown. I sent, we were out of our labs for two and a half months. I bought 3D printers and sent them home with the students. Some took electrochemistry setups, took them home. Dewey built this in his home uh, and, and we delivered on a, a, we converted coal into graphene. We were tasked by the Department of Energy to do one kilogram in a day. And we did the equivalent of 10 kilograms in a day. Uh, and then we developed, developed uh, delivered it six months early. You say it must be a lot of electricity. It is not. $30 in electricity per ton of material. No water, no solvents, self-purify. Sounds too good to be true. I agree. Uh, the company is called Universal Matter, uh, flash graphene and other 2D materials. They'll do have their one ton per day pilot plant by this summer uh, uh, being built. And uh, here's the CEO, John Van Leeuwen. He's taken other academic uh, inventions and brought them to the, uh, this was in Canada. He did uh, uh, eco-synthetics and he brought it to the lar second largest IPO in Canada. Uh, 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 so now, now he's, he's doing this. Dewey is, is the inventor of this process. It was founded in 2019. It's about 50 employees because they, they, just, they just subsumed what was the largest graphene manufacturer in, in, uh, in the UK uh, and got all of their, 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 um, their customer base because uh, uh, the ability to make graphene is orders of magnitude less cost than traditional methods. And so every other company is, is, is having a rough time. I guess you could, you could short these other companies if you want to, because uh, they're going to have a rough time. Uh, so it's going into concrete. It's going into asphalt roads. One, one percent in an asphalt road will triple the life of an asphalt road. It's just that you could never meet the price point before to get them into an asphalt road. We put 0.1 percent in concrete. You use 30 percent less concrete, 30 percent less. Concrete is 8% is of all CO2 emissions by humans comes from the making of concrete. Uh, it's going into paints and coatings, going into wood composites, metals, plastic composites. Uh, uh, it'll go into, in, there'll be a GMP line for going into uh, bone composites. We published papers of its efficacy in lubricants, in films, in anti-corrosion. So it's going into many applications. It just could never before hit the price point that was needed. Now that's gonna change because of this technology that Dewey has developed. How is this an energy effort? Well, where's energy gonna come from in the next 20 years? Well, what we do today is we combust methane plus oxygen makes CO2 in water. That blows out about 800 kilojoules per mole. In 20 years, that won't be done anymore. Methane, you strip off the hydrogens. You make hydrogen plus carbon solid. The carbon, then, then the hydrogen that you get, you mix with oxygen, put it in a fuel cell and get water. These two reactions combined blow out 400 kilojoules per mole of energy. So you only get half the energy out. But when you look at the efficiencies, it's, all, it's, it's about the same because this is only 25 to 40% efficiency depending on the system that you're using. This is 90% efficiency, this is 80% efficiency. So the actual amount of energy you get out, that's why 
ExxonMobil, Shell, Saudi Ranco, they've all, all joined in on the carbon hub at Rice uh, because this is the future of where, where we're going to get energy from. It's from hydrocarbons still with zero CO2 emissions. Hydrocarbons with zero CO2 emissions. The problem was, what do you do with all this carbon? Well, if we're blowing out 30 billion tons of CO2 every year, we'd be generating 8 billion tons of carbon. Well, we want to turn that into graphene and put that all over graphene. So Universal Matter has gotten $10 million grant from Canada, along with Suncor, which got $30 million of a $40 million grant to take this carbon. Universal Matter is to take this carbon and turn it into graphene. So where would you put 8 billion tons? You could put 8 billion tons of carbon into cement today with, without adding it to anything else. There's enough cement. Cement and concrete blow away all other building materials. So you could, you could deposit it there. Why is this good? Because any other asset you bring up from under the ground is going to end up in our CO2 cycle, even if you don't combust it. If it when it goes into a landfill, the thing is going to decompose, it'll be taken up by plants, the plants die, it's going to turn into CO2 not graphene. Graphene is very slow to convert to CO2. It's natural agglomerates or the natural mineral graphite. If graphite could be eaten by microbes, we wouldn't have any graphite in the world. So we have big graphite mines because, because uh, 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 it, this is available, because uh, uh, microbes don't eat this rapidly. How is this an environmental effort? Well, waste food, 30 to 40% of all food is thrown out. It has to be. It goes bad. Worldwide. And that forms not just CO2 in landfills, that forms, um, that, 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 that forms methane, which is much worse greenhouse gas. Lots of waste plastic in the world, uh, lots of waste tires, all of those form graphene in the flash graphene process. Here's all the different types of plastics that humans use in bulk. We convert all of them. This is the spectrum of graphene. They've all been converted in the graphene. It's, it's hard to compete with virgin plastic in price. Recycled plastic is usually about the same price or a little bit more than virgin plastic, depending on where the oil prices are. It's because of the human involvement in the separation. That's the biggest thing. We don't separate anything. Throw all the plastics together, flash, boom, graphene. So the mixture all forms graphene. Uh, linear versus circular economy. Linear, you get raw materials, you produce, you use, you throw it out. Circular economy, you just keep reusing it. That's what we want to, that's where we want to be in a circular economy. Uh, end of life vehicle, this is work that was done by Kevin in the back there. Uh, this was a, a collaboration we had with Ford in, in, uh, in, in Europe. So what happens is, is that in Europe right now, every vehicle at the end of its life comes back to the manufacturer. So 40 years afterward, here's your vehicle back for, and you can only landfill 5%. In Europe, you can only landfill 5%. Where well, the metals can be melted down. What do you do with 200 to 350 kilograms of plastic for, for every lightweight vehicle? What do you do with the plastic? A lot of these are engineering plastics. So they're, not, they're not thermoplastics, they're thermosets. They can't, be, they can't be recycled. What do you do with them? Well, we got 10 pounds of it from their stripper lot Wires, every wire is stripped, every foam cushion seat, every seat cover, every, all of that. Kevin got that. He flashed it. He turned it into graphene. He sent it to Ford Detroit. Ford Detroit put that in their composites because since February 2020, all Fords have had graphene in it. Every foam cushion seat in a Ford since February 2020, underhood insulation, it's all graphene, and they're going to more graphene. It lightweights the vehicle. It did the sound absorbing. And it in increased the, the Young's modulus and the compressive modulus in this, in this foam cushion seats. So you can see the foam cushion seats that have a, it's a little bit darkened because of the graphene. So it worked. It did everything that they wanted it to do. And then we said, send us the composites. They sent us the composites. We flashed it, turned it back into graphene. So you see the life cycle here. Go ahead, make your composites with graphene. When you're done with your composites, flash it again, turn the whole thing into graphene, and use that over and over again. It's a great story. Graphene is non-toxic. It's even used in several medical applications. If you drink whiskey, it comes out of a charred barrel. We have looked at whiskey coming out of a charred barrel. It has graphene in it. You've been drinking graphene. 
Um, it's naturally occurring in the environment. It's agglomerates of the natural mineral graphite. It's a terminal natural sink for carbon. Uh, you don't have to stop carbon from entering the CO2 cycle forever. You only have to stop it for 100 years because in 100 years, we'll have different energy sources and CO2 won't be our problem. Uh, it can be used in composites of all types. You don't have to wash the composites or anything. It just burns everything else away. Uh, the flash process requires no solvent, no water, no purification. The electrical flashing cost is 30 to $35 per metric ton in electricity costs. That's it. And so because we're not heating a furnace, we're putting all the energy into the material in a very short amount of time, sub one second time, and you get graphene. At the current prices of 60 to 100K per ton for graphene, that is a huge upcycle. Now the graphene prices are gonna come down, but they're gonna, the, the company will continue to charge whatever the market will bear. Uh, so we are starting now a number of different companies based upon this flash dual heating system. Flash dual heating, the same system that's been being scaled by Universal Matter. Nobody's ever scaled flash dual heating before. Universal Matter is doing it. They'll be at one ton production in their pilot plant by this summer. Uh, there's several other things we can do with this, and we have papers on many of these. So one is NUCO1 is flash heating for rare earth elements. Rare earth elements are what's at the bottom of the periodic table. We need them for computers and smartphones. The U.S. used to be in the business of rare earth elements. About 15 years ago, we shut it down because you go deep into the ground and what came, came back up with it was radioactive water. So you always had to get rid of a lot of radioactive waste. And, and uh, uh, so the U.S. shut down the industry, shut it down. And then what happened is China raised the prices on rare earth elements tenfold, tenfold, because we can't take radioactive water and pump it back down whole. China can. And so, 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 they, they continue to sell this, but the price went way up. And so it's become now a national security interest to be able to get rare earth elements. It turns out coal has rare earth elements in it, but it's diluted. It's in a lot of carbon. What happens after you burn coal is you're left with the inorganic portion, silicon, aluminum, calcium, iron. And, and uh, this is what's called fly ash. We have mountains, mountains of fly ash in the United States from many, many years of burning coal. It is considered a toxic waste, fly ash. We can take fly ash and we flash it and we get out the rare earth elements. So we're able to remove now the rare earth elements. Why can't you remove it without flashing? What happens in the furnace is it's 2100 degrees centigrade in that coal furnace. That forms an aluminosilicate glass over the rare earth element particles. In order to get at the rare earth element particles now, you have to break that glass. But these are micron-sized particles, so you have to do what's called a sodium hydroxide roast. You roast it with sodium hydroxide, that will etch through the glass. Then you treat it with 12 molar hydrochloric acid to wash out the rare earth elements. We just flash it. The flash process heats at 10 to the fifth Kelvin per second, cools at 10 to the fourth. A Kelvin degree is the same as a centigrade degree. So it heats at 10 to the fifth centigrade per second, cools at 10 to the fourth, that breaks glass. Glass can't take drastic temperature changes quickly. If you take a hot piece of glass and stick it into ice water, that thing's gonna crack. If you take a hair dryer to your frozen window of your, of your car, that glass is going to crack. So the glass cracks and then we just use 0.1 molar HCl because what happens is the phosphates get carbothermically reduced to the oxides. And then once they've been reduced to the oxides, then they wash out with just 0.1 molar acid rather than 12 molar acid. So that's, that's, uh, uh, this has been licensed now from the university and Mark's helping to get that company going. We can do the same thing with, with bauxite residue or red mud, which is the residue that's left after aluminum production. U.S. doesn't have much problem with that. Caribbean, it's a big problem. Uh, uh, Asia, it's a big problem. Europe, it's a big problem. And uh, uh, this has rare earth elements. We've done it with bauxite residue. Uh, this is uh, printed circuit boards. Printed circuit boards, it's not really my cell phone, your cell phone. These are server farms. Every time you save something to the cloud, there's really no cloud there. There is, there, there's, a, there is a printed circuit board somewhere that this is going to lodge on. And they'll replace this every three years. So there are mountains of printed circuit boards. There's a lot of precious metals in those printed circuit boards. 
We flash the printed circuit board. You can't just wash these with acid because these are laminated layers. They have plastic layers, they have oxide layers. We just flash it, it breaks all the layers. And then we just, we flash out, we add halogen and we just, we add uh, chlorine to it. And all the, 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 the precious metals just distill on out. It removes also the toxic metals. What's left over after we flash it is clean enough to be agricultural soil in California. That's, that's what this flashing process does. Again, again, the same type of process that's being developed. We've already published a paper where we can flash battery anodes. You flash the battery anode, and then the result of this is this battery anode is rejuvenated and ready to go again. We're just finishing up the paper on the cathode side, the flashing of the cathode. We take what's called black mass. It's the conglomerate between the anode and the cathode. You can flash that. The black mass is going to separate once we pour this into water. It floats up to the top. The, 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 the anode floats up to the top, and we get out all the elements back out. And so, so uh, this is work. Felicia has done some of this work. And then we also can remediate soil this way, so a big soil remediation process where we can take soil that has, has uh, uh, we remove the heavy metals from the soil, the toxic organics. We tried to get, we tried to get uh, contaminated soil. Very hard to get. People don't want to share it with us because it's a liability issue. So we got some soil from Rice University and we just contaminated it. As chemists, we know how to do that. It's very <laughs> easy to do. And, uh, and, and, and um, um, Lucas has, has kept our, our flash dual heating systems running and, and uh, so we can flash the soil, we can flash out all the, the, the heavy metals, all the carbons will graphitize, and then PFAS. PFAS is per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. If you've not heard about PFAS, it's going to become a household word very soon. It is a real problem in the world, PFAS, PFAS. And, and uh, um, it's in all of our bodies, all of us. It's in our children's bodies. It's in the bodies of, 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 of embryos in, in pregnant women. It's, it's, uh, it's all over. This is, remember, the Scotch guard that was sprayed on everything to protect it. That's PFAS. Uh, uh, firefighters' foam was all PFAS. That's mostly where the problems have come from because they practice over and over again, and that washes into the water systems. It's in all our water. Uh, it's, I've been told that if you drink a year's worth of tap water, you get the equivalent by eating one freshwater fish. One freshwater fish, because that fish has become a filter for the, the, the lake. And now, and now you eat that fish, it's, it's a year's worth of tap water drinking for accumulation of PFAS. And, and uh, uh, so PFAS is a big problem. And if you want to say, well, what does PFAS do to your body? Every problem you have is because of PFAS. <laughs> if you look it up, <laughs> what doctors have said, every, it goes to the endocrine system, to the immune system, and, and uh, uh, so just look up the list of things, even depression, everything <laughs> you can attribute to PFAS. When we check the soil for drainage, and the soil is actually better. We grow, we have more germination, so we've checked it with the agronomy department. So, that, so that'll be another new code that we'll be starting, and also the treatment of PFAS in a big way. This is how we've transitioned them, this is how we've gone about it, and uh, we just tried to take these companies and launch them, and this is what we've done over the past eight years. Prior to this, I used to always license the technology to big companies, and I realized that that is a prescription for making nano dollars. Uh, it would get into these big companies and it would never get developed properly. But the only way for us to really make money is to have equity in a company. So we start a small company, we'll bring it on, and then we may do a JV with a big company. But now we have equity in a company. That's the only way for us to make money because it, we don't get much equity in Schlumberger or in Apache. Uh, uh, so so, so that, that's the way we've been running this. And I'll open it up for questions. So we have time for a few questions here, and we can continue the conversation afterwards as we kind of head upstairs. So uh, I hope you can join us for a little while. Sure, yeah, sure. No, I'm around. I'm around. Question. Go ahead. Go ahead. What makes the nanobodies selective so they don't kill healthy cells? Right. They'll kill any cell they attach to. So, so there, there's there's two ways to address this: is that we only shine the light on the area that we want it to hit. So if there's a tumor 
you can you can inject it systemic. It doesn't bother the cells, and it'll clear in in in, in a day. It's gone. But it sticks to the tumor, and then you just shine the light on the tumor. We the new generation of, of nano machines that we have, we use a near IR light, and that gives us ten centimeters of penetration through human flesh. So you can get pretty deep with that. The other way is, and we've done this many times, is you, we attach a peptide to the nano machine, and then it goes to the cell of interest. And so you have a double safety mechanism. It's only gone to the cell of interest, and then you only shine it on the area that you want. If you have a bacteria, say, that's running through your bloodstream, there's already lights that are on the market where you can just insert them right on into an artery, and this thing is just, as the blood just flows by, it's being exposed to the light. And in that case, you can just put on a peptide and stick it to the cell of interest. Question. Don't be shy. Go ahead. So for, for the flash graphene that you're dealing with the, the plastic waste, are there yes. particular um, um, polymer chemistries that you're targeting? Because like the PETs, HDPEs that, that, that have really strong markets that have higher recycling rates, um, and, and, and those will kind of be necessary um, for companies and brands like when we uh, institute um, um, recycling content um, goals or laws, or whatever policies that, that are put in place. Um, so, I, so I mean, like, so, so those, um, th those, a lot of companies are kind of relying on to, to, to meet these, um, you know, policy goals. But are, are there particular chemistries that, that that technology is focusing on? Is it, is it specifically the hard to recycle plastics? And, and, and the difficult chemistries, or, or are you looking kind of like, you know, targeting all of them? We're targeting all of them. We don't have to separate them. It works, as, as you know, only half of the plastic waste is mismanaged plastic, is, um, is plastic bottles and things. A lot of it is, 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 is uh, construction plastics, nice. and those are much harder to recycle. We flash it all. We flash it all. If it has chlorine, like in PVC, that comes off as HCL, and you ca catch that in a secondary stream. Uh, so the header atoms just come blowing on out because carbon doesn't sublime until about 3,600 Kelvin. Most other things are subliming long before that. They're, they're, they're coming out. And so we, get, we, we purify it in that way. So you don't have to separate. If it's separated, you, you can do that as well. But the upcycle, the market for the graphene is worth so much more than generally these plastic markets. It's a very good way to go. Uh, if you wanted to sift off HDPE, you could. I mean, and you just flash everything else. Uh, uh, so the, the plastics, um, you know, for a while there, we had to add a conductive material, but now we know how to add a conductive carbon and we just get that back after the flash and then it just recycles all around. So, Doing the plastic is not their first goal. It is just making bulk graphene, and that's from usually a coal or petroleum-derived product that's very high in carbon content. What Kevin has just done is he's shown how much hydrogen he can get off. So now what we're doing is we get, for example, when you flash high-density polyethylene, you get graphene, and we get about 65% of the available hydrogen atoms in there come out as H2. So now we're making hydrogen. It's a beautiful fuel source, and the other hydrogen is coming out in small molecules, methane, ethane, propane. So if you, if you had just a uh, bulk amorphous carbon, and, um, can you run it through? Is it, can you do a, a batch, or, a, or is it a continuous flow of? Uh... I, you know, I don't know what the company's planning on now because I'm not associated with the company, but my guess is it'd be a semi-batch. Boom, flash, and then away it goes. So for example, um, is there anything about the morphology of the graphene as it comes out that, I mean, the, is there any? You know, so, so in other words, you, you, you can run it through something like this flash and, and it, whatever's coming out on the right side is graphene. Is there a more, yes. So we can vary this. This is the nice thing about this. So we have, we have published papers on this, that we can take this carbon and the evolution time scale is one second. If we stop it at five milliseconds, it hasn't yet crystallized. By about 100 milliseconds, you have graphene. If you continue to heat it, you get concentric rings of systems. In the first five milliseconds, you get, if you, if you have fluorinated graphene like Teflons or something, fluorinated carbons like Teflon, 
you get, or, or PFAS, you get nano diamond. So nano diamond in the first five milliseconds. 100 milliseconds, you're at graphene. At, 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 so 100 milliseconds is 0.1 second. At, at, uh, the longer you run this, the larger the sheet of the graphene. Sometimes you want small sheets, sometimes you want large sheet, depending on what your composite is. And then if you continue to run it out to a second, you get what they call concentric rings. So I say it evolves, but the evolution time period is one second. And because you're running electronically, you can stop at any place you want across that plus or minus a millisecond. It's really an amazing process. Dewey could tell you more. Lucas can tell you more. Lucas runs our, 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 our equipment that, that Dewey actually first built. And, uh, uh, but that, that's what the dynamic control gives you. Thank you. Uh, for this uh, technology, what is, um, is it possible to take also liquids? No. Uh, uh, oh, you need to... in, in, in any carbon solid, any carbon solid. Many people ask me, can, can you do CO2? Can you just convert CO2 to carbon? Let me tell you the problem with CO2. And this is a thermodynamic problem. And you always have to pay homage to thermodynamics. You just can't get around it. So CO2 is extremely stable. This is, this is like God's stability is CO2. Hydrocarbon is up here in stability. It's not nearly as stable as CO2. The energy that it takes to bring CO2 back up to say a hydrocarbon or an all carbon system or hydrocarbon is enormous. Whatever, it, whatever energy you got out going down, you have to put twice as much to go up because just, just because of inefficiencies. So thermodynamically, it's the same up and down, but you have, if, if it was 800 kilojoules per mole of methane to CO2 of energy you get out, you're gonna to have to put in like 1600 kilojoules per mole to get it. There's no way around that. So if people say that they're converting CO2 into into carbon, they're putting a lot of energy. And the only way you can do that is, is if you say, economically, is if you say the electricity or whatever source you're using is coming from a renewable source. But if that renewable source had been supplementing the grid and you took it now to use, you're gonna to have to burn hydrocarbon to, to, to power that grid anyway. So there's really no net gain there. So any technology now, you might bring it to, to oxalic acid, which is a carbon with, with, with three oxygens on it, with three carbon oxygen bonds rather than four. Oxalic acid, then you didn't have to bring it up so much because the carbon still has the two oxygens but three carbon oxygen bonds rather than the, the previous four. So it's thermodynamics, you just can't get around, around it. Um, uh, so could you fundamentally do it? Yes, we have a paper where there's a company that is taking CO2 and converting it to amorphous carbon. We take that amorphous carbon and we've converted it into, gra into graphene. I've looked at their numbers and, and uh, if their numbers are accurate, they're doing this fairly efficiently. I, I, I don't, I'm not in their company, so I can't check their numbers. But the thermodynamics just make the conversion of CO2 to carbon or hydrocarbon very, very hard. And for biomass? Or... Biomass works great. Biochar. Waste. Pardon? Wet waste. Wet waste, no. We have to dry it. We can be about 10% wet, but it can't be more than that. We are doing, uh, for example, Carla has a project. She's taking household uh, uh, waste, household waste from trash companies. They have a process where uh, apparently like 50% of household waste from the waste people in New York City is who we're working with tell me that it's wet. 50% is, is water weight and household waste. I didn't know that. But in any way, they, they have a process where they're, they pre-char it they send it to us, boom, we turn it into graphene. So this is household waste turned into graphene. Yeah, it, it works. Anything that's carbon solid will work. Question here. We have room for a couple more questions before we have to get out. So if you think about your graphene cycle, right? You basically cycle your graphene again and again. Yes. But at a certain point, you may make more graphene. Is there any possibility that you can bring that back to the biologic carbon circle from graphene? So, so you want to so you want to bring the graphene back to hydrocarbon? Global biology, like a carbon cycle, bring that back to the environment cycle. That's super stable. At a certain time, whether it can become a 
gluten, whatever, or something we want to use. Yeah. So from the other kinds. I, I hear. I don't know how to bring it back to. I don't know how to convert this carbon, this graphene back to a, a carbohydrate. I don't know how to do that. Um, that's going to take a microbial organism, as you know. Some you're going to have to develop some microbe to eat this stuff up, to bring to bring it back. Right, right. To, to bring it back to a biologic carbon, you, we're going to have to do that. I mean, it's a fair question. Uh, you, you know, could we be making so much graphene that it's a mess? Yeah, you could, but then you just bury it. I mean, it's like burying graphite. It's a naturally occurring compound. It's not like carbon nanotubes. It's not like it's not like all these other things we've had to worry about. This, if you want to bury it, you can bury it. But right now, there's a huge market, and I'm telling you, it's going to go into every material you see, every material you walk on. We'll have on this it'll be lighter for example i one of the projects we've had in our group is to concrete concrete is 2500 years old why do we make things out of concrete anymore can we just make it out of high graphene materials with a little bit of epoxy so we've been making these sort of things and trying to compare it to where concrete would be so first of all what we've done is we've put graphene in concrete and higher percentages in concrete and what can we do in, 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 uh, in, in doing this sort of thing to, to, to really have a material? So we've, we've put, we took the aggregate. So as you know, concrete has stones and, 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 and sand. That's called the aggregate. It's about 40% aggregate by weight. We substituted the aggregate with graphene. We just made the graphene the same particle size as the, as, as, as the aggregate. We excel in three areas by like 20% in one of the, the areas we were 11% shorter, but we were 25% lighter. And that, that's going into concrete. But can we just totally do away with the concrete and make roads out of this kind of carbon material? That's what we'd like to do. Get away from concrete, get away from aluminum. Aluminum is a huge amount of electricity to make aluminum because you take aluminum oxide, sacrificial carbon electrode, you convert the carbon to carbon dioxide and, gen and make a, a, a aluminum metal with a huge amount of electricity, you build an electric plant next to an aluminum plant. That's what you have to do. Can we substitute aluminum? And that's what Ford is doing. Can they take plastic composites and now strengthen these with graphene and get away from aluminum? So that, that's, I think there's gonna, for many years to come, we'll be able to use this. Let's take one more question. So, sounds like science is sorted, I think to a degree, I don't know about it, but. What holds us back from scaling that? Is it is it supply chain issue? Is it a uh, regulate uh, regulated uh, regulation sort of issue? What what what's regulate? What's, you, yeah. you mean from 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 moving the graphene production even faster? Yeah. Well, is that what you're asking? At least if the science works, then yes. Yeah, assuming all does sound fantastic. Yes. But then what what prevents us from scaling quicker? Okay. Is it a demand problem? Is it supply? Issue? Well, do we? What's your problem? Why can't you scale this thing? faster, do we? I mean, so so this has never been scaled before. So we went from from 50 milligrams in our laboratory, 50 milligrams, to it'll be a ton a day production by this summer. There are no regulatory things that are stopping us other than getting approvals for our air handling system. But the government is behind us. So, so I think Universal Matter has gotten like 30 or $40 million in grants already. So that's non-dilutive. And, 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 and this company is, is, is oversubscribed. I mean, there's a lot of people that want in on this. Uh, uh, so what, and then they'll, they'll scale from there. So Dewey, what, what, are the, what are the things that you can say? What's slowing you down? Why can't you do a hundred tons a day by this summer? By well, what you say, I think we have no problem. <laughs> All right. So I'm, I'm going to offer to let me take that conversation up at the, at the tomorrow afterwards. I actually have one question for you. I want to close and use the privilege of that. How many of those companies that you have launched actually have a presence in Houston? Um, let's see. Not a lot. Let's see. One, two, three, four. Five. Maybe five. It'd be fine. Well, now, we have something to work on. Yeah. And, and, and part of this is th because, and, and, and I'll tell you, it's not that I didn't try. No, it's not. It's not that I didn't try. I'll tell you, I mean, I've, I've had Houstonians come in. A prophet is not without honor, except in their hometown. 
And people come in and they think, oh, well, you know, how, how are you going to scale this up? You know, I, I showed flash graphene to Houstonians and they'd come in and kick the tires and we'd show them a little flash. You're going to get that to do too much? And they walk out. And I have people from, from other countries that are willing to drop money into this. If I just tell the Israelis, I think this is a good technology, they will do it that day. That day, they've had enough successes with this. They will run with it that day. And people look at me and they say, what do you know? You know, you're at Rice, you know, and then they, 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 they kick this thing around. And I'm not waiting. You walk out the door, it's over. It, it's over because I already have people around. I'd love to see these things move out in Houston. But when they don't, I'm not waiting. I'm going. So, so there's people that trust us enough. They've had enough wins. There's nothing that I have given them that the technology-wise didn't work. There have been times where some of these have had rough starts, not because of the technology, but as you know, there's three things you have to do. You have to have technology, money, and management. Any one of those three legs is, is damaged, that stool falls over. And uh, uh, it has always been a problem that we've had, it's always management. And, and that's, not my, that's not what I do. That's up to the financiers to build up the management. And uh, I don't mortgage my house to get these companies going. I don't leave the university. This is why I don't work with VCs. They want me to stop what you're doing and get involved in this company. We want you to have skin in the game. And, and I just don't do it. I just don't do it because there's so much fun we're having in the university. I'm a professor. We license this stuff out. I'll sit on a scientific advisory board for six months. Beyond that, you're ahead of me. I mean, the folks in Universal Matter, they don't need me. They're way ahead of me on this scaling issue. And so, so within six months, they eat, drink, and sleep one issue, they get ahead of me. And, and, and then these companies go, and that's just the way I work. And that model doesn't work for a lot of VCs. They want the inventor in the game, and I'm gonna stay a professor. So that, that's part of the problem. If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button, and that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, that's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work, and if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you.